prayer this morning? Hallelujah. Is that your prayer this morning? God, you can have your way. Yes. You can move it over, God. My, my anxiety, you can move it over, God. My, my ambition, God, you can move it over. My frustration, God, you can move it over. My jealousy, God, my envy, God, you can move it over. Is that your prayer today? God, move it over. Make, make way. Make way inside of me. and sisters, there is indeed a word from the Lord. We're going to look today at the book of Acts, Acts chapter 7. We're going to look there in Acts chapter 7, beginning down around the 40. The 51st verse, Acts chapter 7, beginning at the 51st verse. We're going to read down uh, to we're going to read all the way down to the end of that chapter. Um, and as we prepare to get into the scripture and the word together, uh, many of you know you've been on this journey with us where we have been talking about these leadership values. In a real sense, we've been having a leadership development seminar that is stretching for six months. We began with the value of courage in January. And then in February, we preached and taught about humility. Uh, and we just finished our segment, or, um, and then we did responsibility in March, and here we are in April, uh, looking at this uh, imperative that kingdom leaders, really all kingdom believers, uh, must be inspired by God's Holy Spirit. Next month, we're going to talk about servanthood and stewardship, and then we're going to end up talking about true, being true to God, true to the calling, true to the kingdom, true to your family. But this month, we are focusing on inspired by the Holy Spirit. And as it turns out, each of these values we're putting into a framework and in order to examine them in a way that makes them more clear. And the framework that I'm realizing with the Holy Spirit is that the Holy Spirit is a gift that keeps on giving. The Holy Spirit is a gift that keeps on giving. It, uh, we looked at the first Sunday, how, or looked at the first Wednesday, how it gives us new assurances. Assurances that we are a member of the body of Christ, assurances that we are God's children, assurances that Christ lives with us. And then we looked um, at how the Holy Spirit gives us a new fullness. We talked about that on Wednesday night and on the Sunday last, the first Sunday, we talked about how the Holy Spirit gives us new perspectives. Remember, we talked about hindsight, foresight, and insight. And today, we're going to look at the, how the Holy Spirit gives us new possibilities. The Holy Spirit gives us new possibilities. So I'm going to read, we're going to pray. We're going to get into the word together. Amen? Amen. So let's look at Acts chapter 7. And here we find the end of a speech that one of the first 
seven deacons gives to the people while he's being um, examined in a court-like setting. And he ends the speech to the religious leaders and he says, you stiff-necked people, <laughs> uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit. As your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who announced beforehand the coming of the righteous one, whom you now have betrayed and murdered. You received the law as delivered by angels and did not keep it. Now when they heard these things, they were enraged and they ground their teeth at him. But he, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears, rushed together at him. Then they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. And as they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Let us pray. Holy and all wise God, God, I shudder to think about all that you mean to us. Your word is indeed a light unto our path and a lamp unto our feet, God. And I ask now that you use me even in spite of me, that your word might go forth with clarity and with purpose, that your people might be edified, but more than anything, God, that your name might be glorified. It has already been glorified. Glorify it again in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I'm going to... See, this, this microphone seems like it, no, we're going to stick with, we'll stick with this microphone. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Brothers and sisters, this may seem like a strange scripture for me to lift up and put the tag on the text the Holy Spirit gives us new possibilities. For it looks like here we find someone who did nothing wrong and yet met their demise in a brutal and gruesome way. Well, my brothers and sisters, I believe that as we look at this text, we will get an understanding of how the Holy Spirit does indeed open up new possibilities for us, even in the most difficult points in our life. For there are at least three new possibilities that are opened in this passage that we are looking at together today. Unless we get caught up in the Holy Spirit and I can't get through all of them, I'll give them to you here at the beginning. We are emboldened to proclaim Christ. That's a new possibility that the Holy Spirit gives us. We are exposed to the power of Christ and we are emancipated to follow after Christ. It is amazing to me that Stephen, who was someone who was full of wisdom and full of the Holy Spirit, someone who had gone about serving the Lord with gladness, would find himself in such a horrible situation. For Stephen, as you may know, was one of those original seven individuals who was called out at the beginning of Acts chapter 6 
to help the apostles so that they would be more free to study and preach the word of God. Some of you may remember that during this period in Acts, the church is breaking forth and blossoming and growing multitudes and thousands of people at a time are joining the Christian way. And so as the movement begins to grow, there, 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 there becomes a, a, a necessity to expand the ranks of the leadership. And so here we find these seven individuals who were brought in in order to make sure that those who were most in need, they were the widows who were descended from the Greeks and uh, they, they were the ones who were marginalized and left out. They, they had to fight for the scraps. Uh, even in the midst of this Christian community, they, they, they were not being taken care of. And so the apostles decided that they would put seven individuals to make sure that these widows, these marginalized women who were being left out and left to the side would be taken care of in a way that would dignify the faith that they had in Jesus Christ. Well, brothers and sisters, our kingdom movement is a movement that always shifts in a direction for those who are marginalized, left out, and left to the side. Even to this day, my brothers and sisters, I hope that we would have the spirit of this ancient community and always recognize that it is the lost and the last, the least and those left out to whom we are called to serve and to support. Well, my brothers and sisters, Stephen was doing this work. In fact, he was working miracles and great signs under the Holy Spirit. And yet there arose some folks that the Bible said became jealous of Stephen. Well, my brothers and sisters, doesn't it seem that uh, the only time people can all get together is to bring a good person down? Uh, and so they, they got together on one accord, and because they could not find a legitimate reason to persecute Stephen, they came up with some illegitimate reasons. They, they began to lie on Stephen, and they paid some folks to, to make up false charges against Stephen. Stephen had done nothing wrong. All Stephen had done was make sure that the widows uh, who were being rejected and ostracized got fed. He was going around teaching and preaching and proclaiming Christ. He boldly went about doing wonders and amazing things so that other people began to believe in the way, and yet his reward for all of this good stuff was lies and rejection, conspiracies, and people who were trying to bring him down. And so there were folks of the synagogue of the freedmen and uh, uh, folks from the Sadducees who got together and, uh, and they figured out a way to say that this Stephen was speaking against the traditions of Moses and so he deserved to be put on trial. So Stephen, my brothers and sisters, uh, sat in the courtroom, so to speak, and, and they looked on him. And the Bible says that as they looked at Stephen, they gazed at him, it says, and he looked like an angel. And so here he is uh, on trial for blasphemy, and the people who were going to make the decision for or against him, when they looked at him, they saw someone who looked like an angel. My brothers and sisters, there was some sort of miraculous way that the people recognized that Stephen was an angel. Some, now, now, before we get it twisted, before we get it mixed up, angel does not mean uh, somebody who is a goody two-shoes. Angel comes from the Greek angelos, and it means messenger. And so uh, uh, it, it's, it looked like Stephen had a message from the master. And I believe somebody right now, when you find yourself in difficult situations, God can set it up so that people will look at you and they will take a pause, take a breath, because they will feel in their bosom that there's a message on your lips. 
that there's a message they need to hear, that there's something that they need to be on tiptoed expectations so that when you open your mouth, God will make a way for them to hear. Well, my brothers and sisters, uh, Stephen began to speak, and you can look in Acts and 6 and 7, and, and he begins to make a speech, and he walks through the history of Israel. But he tells the story from the flip side. Now, now my, my, my mother understands. She, she remembers those 45-inch records, and there was always the flip side. <laughs> On the flip side, Stephen looks at the, the, the story of Israel, but, but he does not tell the story in a way that makes them proud and puffed up. Instead, he walks line by line from Abraham to Moses to the prophets, and he points out in concrete ways how over and over and over again the people missed the mark. They would not follow God. They had every advantage. God had touched them. God had given them uh, the law. God, God had walked with them uh, uh, with, with a pillar of fire by day and a pillar of smoke by night. God had spoken to them by putting the Spirit on human flesh and allowed prophets to speak in their midst, and yet they never really trusted God. Well, my brothers and sisters, that, that's a good lesson for us to, to realize that, that we can look at our story in a way that shows all of our accomplishments, but the more rewarding, the more truthful way to look at our story is to go back over and look at all our mistakes, to look at our mistakes and our missteps, the times when we would not listen to God, the times that we would not trust God, because when we look at the flip side, we'll be able to realize that, 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 that it's God's mercy that sustains us. It's God's mercy that keeps us. It's God's mercy that keeps the relationship and allows God to abide with us. And so he tells this story about the glory of God's mercy. Uh, and they, they get gnashed in the teeth because the bottom line is he told them that they were stiff-necked and uncircumcised of heart and mind, that they always resist God's Holy Spirit. Is there anybody here who can be honest with yourself and realize that, that even after all that God has done, you have your stiff neck moments? <laughs> now, we cannot say as believers that we're uncircumcised of heart and mind because we are of the new circumcision, the new covenant, and biblically speaking, we have been saved and we are always uh, reconciled and at peace with God. But, but every now and then, we know that even those of us who are blood-bought, born-again believers in Jesus Christ, we make our mistakes. But these folks, they, they didn't want to hear about the mistakes. They, they didn't want to hear about God's mercy. They, they wanted to understand their story in a way that gave them pride and allowed them to be puffed up. And so when Stephen punctures their pride and uh, doesn't allow them to be puffed up, well, my brothers and sisters, the Bible says that they rushed upon him with one accord. And yet Stephen still begins to proclaim Jesus Christ. Uh, he, he cries out, and he says, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Well, let, let me try to say it like this. There is a way in which when we proclaim Jesus Christ and we are rejected and mistreated, th there's a way in which the Holy Spirit anchors us so that our light continues to shine. I spent a lot of time on the water growing up um, uh, with my family, and uh, there, there are lots of lighthouses out on the Chesapeake Bay and uh, through, up and down the East Coast, uh, but, but my favorite lighthouse is Thomas Lighthouse. Some of you may know Thomas Lighthouse. It's on Thomas Point, just south of Annapolis, and Thomas Point Lighthouse doesn't look like a typical lighthouse. It looks like somebody built a house on some iron stilts and anchored it on the rock in the middle of the water. 
Uh, it, it doesn't, it's not cylindrical and tall. It's not on the land. It's out in the middle of the water on some iron stilts on top of a rock. And it looks like a regular old house, a house like you would find sitting in somebody's cul-de-sac. Well, my brothers and sisters, Thomas Lighthouse is amazing to me because uh, that means that the light keeper in the olden days, when the light keeper lived there, when the storm was raging, the light keeper kept the lighthouse on. And for those of us who were at sea looking at Thomas Lighthouse, it looked like a house on the water uh, standing on some iron stilts uh, built on top of a rock. And Thomas Lighthouse even though it looked like a regular old house like you would find in somebody's cul-de-sac, it was always shining and dependable. It was dependable in the storm. It was dependable in the nighttime. It was dispendable in gale force winds. Well, my brothers and sisters, the good news of the gospel is that the Holy Spirit gives us that kind of dependability. When people talk about you, your light will still shine. When people encourage you, your light will shine. When people discourage you, your light will still shine. When people won't come around you, your light will still shine. You'll be like that lighthouse built on... Uh, did I mention that the lighthouse was anchored on a rock? Somebody knows the story. The rock that's taller than I. The rock is Jesus Christ. Well... You got that point. You, you got that point that we're emboldened to proclaim Christ in season and out of season. When, when people like us, when people mistreat us, we will proclaim Christ. But then, my brothers and sisters, we're exposed to the power of Christ. And, and being exposed to the power of Christ is, is, is something that is amazing to me because here he is in the midst of persecution, being dragged out of Jerusalem, being dragged out of the city, and here, full of the Holy Spirit, he gazes up into heaven, he sees the glory of God, and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. That would preach all by itself. And, and behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man at the right hand of God. And it says here, my brothers and sisters, but they cried out and stopped their ears and rushed together at him. Well, my brothers and sisters, uh, here he was in the midst of persecution, but he was experiencing the power of Jesus Christ. All right? Some of you may not, may not get it, but, but, but here we find Jesus in this vision of Stephen while he's being persecuted, while he's being mistreated, while the, the heat of of persecution and mistreatment is, is heating up all around him. He is near unto his demise. He cannot save himself from this situation. He looks up at heaven and he experiences the power of God. You see, my brothers and sisters, I'm convinced that the Holy Spirit allows us to experience the power of God constantly and continually through our life. I believe that's why some believers have joy when it doesn't seem like they should have joy, they have peace. When it doesn't seem like they should have peace. And, and what I'm encouraging you all is, is to see God in the big things and the little things wherever you can. Because when you have that state of awe, uh, you will not be so worried about the enemies and the struggles around you. All right, I'm, I'm going to try to try to make this plain. I was... Um, doing my thing as, as a pastor and, you know, going to the hospital, di doing different things. And, and I'm crazy. I get stuck in my feelings and I'm worried about, you know, making it on time to different appointments and, you know, whether or not, I, I, I don't know if I should tell you the whole story, but, uh, but I, I'm not going to tell you the whole story. But, but suffice it to say, I get in my feelings. I'm in the parking lot at Washington Hospital Center on my way to do my pastor thing to pray with somebody. And I'm in my feelings. I'm real hurt. I'm mad. I'm frustrated. I'm upset. There's a lot of stuff going on. I parked my car. I was so upset. Sister Dan, I, I couldn't find my car when I got back. That's how upset I was. And so, um, I, I, but I make my way in, and, and I'm in this moment, and I get inside, uh, and I'm doing my past thing. You know, we pray and all this other stuff. And, and I realized something, Deacon Barnes, I realized something. Uh, I'm standing there in the thing, and I'm doing, I'm praying my prayers and everything. I'm, uh, I, you know, God is finally you know, using me to, to, to comfort and to pray and do all this pastor stuff. And, 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 I, and something in my spirit said, son, look, look at the other people in the room who are visiting. And they all have visitor tags on. 
And, I, and the Spirit took me back through, while I was in my feelings, <laughs> Deacon Dion, while I was in my feelings, I made it all the way through the hospital without getting a visitor badge. That means I was going through employee doors. I was going through employee elevator. Now, I wasn't even real. I was so mad and upset. I wasn't there. But the whole time, God was opening doors. God was making a way so I could get there to do what I needed to do. And I looked around, and everybody had a visitor badge. I was an illegitimate visitor. I was an undocumented worker right there in the hospital room praying my prayer. God will show you God's power in big ways and little ways. You see, brothers and sisters, we, our family, we, we decided um, to, uh, the last minute, we got up at 5 in the morning, put the kids in the minivan in their pajamas, and we started driving northeast, trying to get as close to Cleveland as we could to see the eclipse. We wanted to get into the path of totality. My wife is such a sweet and kind woman. She, she will understand when I'm excited about something, even when I don't look excited, I'm not trying to act excited. She knew that I wanted to get into the path of totality. So she helped me get the kids packed up in their pajamas. We drove the poor kids. It was like the trail of tears. We, we, I wouldn't pull over for nothing. I didn't want to stop. For, I wanted to get to the path of totality. Poor baby was stuck in his chair. Crying. We gave him all kind of, whatever it took to get, we were driving to, we made it to the path of totality. We pulled over, we got to a parking lot. And we got to the path of totality. We looked up. And some of you all who were down here in D.C., there was never a point where you could safely look at the sun because you had to keep the glasses on because even 1% of the sun is still too bright for the human eye. Well, my brothers and sisters, in the path of totality, we could take off our glasses. And we stood there in the shadow of the moon looking up at the glories of the heavens. And, and, and scientists will look at it, and they're not fascinated by it. But, but, but there's little facts like the moon is 400, 400 times smaller than the sun, but the sun is 400 million miles away. And so when the moon gets in front of the sun from the position on Earth, it covers the whole sun, even though it's 1 400th the size of the sun. You don't hear me. It, there is something amazing when we looked up in heaven. Now watch this. It's going to be 30 years or more. Uh, uh, it's going to be, you know, it, it's going to be hundreds of years before we get to the same spot again, the path of totality uh, here on earth. But when you realize and you meet something like that, that is so awesome, you don't have to make it an everyday occurrence. All right. I'm preaching now. Somebody's going to get this. When God reveals things to you in a certain way, it doesn't have to be an everyday. So, all right. Now, I'm not saying, I just told you, in every day, all day, you can see God operating in big ways and small ways. But, but some things you experience, it changes your life, and it doesn't have to be an everyday occurrence. All right. All right. Are you missed? Did you, did you see in the scripture that, that, that Jesus was standing at the right hand of God? All right. Now, now there are images of the glory and, and images, but Jesus is often sitting at the right hand of God. Now, now, this is an image of God's authority, God's glory and God's authority and Jesus's position as intercessor and mediator with the authority to save us and to call us and to have mercy on us. But, but when you stand, oh, somebody missed that. Standing in this ancient culture, when, when you prayed in the synagogue, you didn't sit or kneel. You stood in the synagogue. Standing is a position of prayer in ancient Palestine. So, all right. Y'all aren't going to get excited about this. But here he is. This is a once-in-a-lifetime situation. Stephen, Stephen's life is changed forever because God shows him that God is standing at the right hand of God. That means God is praying for Stephen's situation. The people are getting ready to stone Stephen, but Jesus is appearing to Stephen in a position of prayer position of praying for his disciple, position of praying for his child, praying. Oh, wait a second now. The son of God in prayer for Stephen. 
How much powerful prayer do you think that is? That's enough prayer that it could save Stephen from the stones. It could save Stephen from the persecutors. It could save Stephen from death itself. All right. So it's a life-changing situation. It doesn't have to be an everyday occurrence. But God will expose God's power. But then, my brothers and sisters, we are emancipated to follow after Jesus Christ. You see, I've preached this uh, text over the years, but the first time I preached it was in 1995 in Sale Hall Chapel when I was getting my license to preach. Uh, I'm the first person licensed by the interdenominational chapel, Martin Luther King Chapel uh, at Morehouse College. It's a long story, but but I went there to Sale Hall to preach my initial sermon. I was licensed by Dean Carter, a legendary figure in the, in the church there at, um, at King Chapel. And it's the same chapel that Martin King would have preached in, Howard Thurman, all these dignitaries. And here I was behind the pulpit, and, and the title I took was On the Other Side of the Stones. It, it was a different day, and, uh, uh, and, and what I'm trying to get to here is that uh, that topic is still true today because we are emancipated to follow after Jesus. You see, if you look at the text, some, some of you are shouting amen in the reading of the text because you see echoes of Jesus in the speech that Stephen gives while the stones are being laid at him, thrown at him. And uh, and, and the way stones were, stoning was done back in this day is they would take increasingly large stones and place it on the body of the person as uh, uh, and, 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 and until they could not breathe anymore. And so, brothers and sisters, Stephen, here he echoes like Jesus from the cross, and he says, Father, into your hand I give my spirit. And, and we're talking about the Holy Spirit. And, 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 and we don't have time to get into the theology here, but, but inside every believer, my brothers and sisters, there is the breath that God gives you, that animates you, that gives you your psychology. And thank God for believers, there is also the spirit of God, the breath that flows, the wind that flows from the Father and the Son into the believer's heart. Well, my brothers and sisters, he, he gave up his spirit. And then uh, it, when you're liberated like this, you can do things that you could not do on your own. I'm sure that Stephen in his own psychology and his own mentality, he would not be able to say, Father, forgive them for they... I'm sure that in his own psychology, uh, it's impossible for some of us to say, Father, forgive them for what they did to me. Oh. I'm sure that somebody right now has an opportunity to follow Jesus Christ, to, to, to give yourself, your, your mind into God's abiding presence and to be able to get the kind of emancipation that lets you look back over your life and say that you meant it for evil, but God meant it unto good to save much people alive this day. Is there somebody here right now, and you know that what they did to you was wrong. You know that they mistreated you. You know that they lied against you. You know they tried to hurt you, but you can look back and see they meant it for evil, but God meant it unto good to save much people alive this day. Well, my brothers and sisters, we're emancipated to follow after Jesus. But watch this, just like Jesus, Jesus said, look, if a corn of wheat abides, if it, if, if it abides alone, if it sits on top of the stalk, but if it falls to the ground and dies, then it brings forth much fruit. What I'm trying to tell you, my brothers and sisters, that life goes on. Life goes on. You see, life goes on uh, for us, but, but, but even if we meet our demise, even if we can't continue any further, life goes on because there's somebody on the other side of the stones. Somebody's on the other side of the stones, and they're watching to see how you handle your trials and tribulations.
You say you're a blood-bought, born-again believer in Jesus Christ? Well, let's see you in the midst of the stones. Let's see you in the midst of rejection. Let's see you in the midst of those who desert you. Let's see you in the midst of those who are trying to hurt you. Well, my brothers and sisters, if you follow the example of Jesus, if you follow the example of Stephen, who was full of the Holy Ghost, and if the Holy Ghost stands up tall in you, then you will handle the stones in your life in a way that will cause the people who watch you in the midst of the stones to begin to change in their heart so that they will stop resisting the Holy Spirit and they too will get filled with the Holy Spirit and they will begin to be, you, beca, beca, begin to be like Jesus and they'll begin to be like Stephen and they'll begin to be like you when you're filled with the Holy Spirit and they'll be able to trust God and they'll be able to see the power of God. They'll be able to forgive those who are mistreating them in order that the gospel might go on. Well, I'm trying to finish this thing, but watch this, look. They laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. Some of you, my brothers and sisters, you know this man named Saul. For Saul of Tarsus became uh, one of the, the, the major author of the New Testament. He was the one who was able, uh, he was part Jew, and, uh, but he was raised in the Gentile culture. He was all Jew, but raised in a Gentile culture. He was able to translate the way of God revealed inside of Jewish culture and transport it to Gentile culture. It's because of this man named Saul who stood by and approved of the stoning of Stephen, who stood by and watched the death of Stephen. Something was planted in him and he went from here and he kept on persecuting the church. He persecuted the church in Syria and Samaria. He persecuted the church, but one day on the road to Damascus, God my brothers and sisters, God revealed God's self to Saul. And, and Saul much later says that he is the chief of sinners because he was standing by the, and approving of the death of a good man named Stephen. Well, I'm trying to say, my brothers and sisters, you may not know who's watching you handle your situation. But as the Holy Spirit allows you to operate in supernatural ways, as you deal with your situation, somebody, I believe, is watching you in your situation. They're watching you be a caregiver. They're watching you be a forgiver. They're watching you continue to walk by faith. And they, my brothers and sisters, are receiving seeds in their life. And those seeds will begin to grow in time. They'll begin to get watered in time. And I believe, my brothers and sisters, that they will be increased by the grace of God. So I want to encourage you to follow after Christ. Because, my brothers and sisters, we, we see that uh, what the world needs now is people who are able to follow after Christ. People who are able to forgive under the anointing. People who are able to speak truth to power. People who are able to love in a supernatural way. And my brothers and sisters, that's the kind of faith, my brothers and sisters, that will allow people to be able to say that faith is the assurance. It's the substance of things hoped for. It's the evidence of things not seen. And I believe, my brothers and sisters, that, that, that just like the, the forerunners of the faith, We'll be able to be like that list in Hebrews 11. I, I love that list in Hebrews 11. I'm finished now, but, but, but the, the, the same spirit that was on Jesus is the same spirit that was on Stephen. It's the same spirit that was on Abel and allowed Abel to offer a pleasing sacrifice demonstrating the righteousness through faith. It was the same spirit that was on Enoch that allowed Enoch to walk faithfully so that he walked with God. He did not experience death according to the Bible, but he walked on with God. It's the same spirit that was on Noah that allowed Noah to build an ark in obedience to God, uh, a warning about the flood, and, uh, but continuing uh, the righteousness through faith. It's the same spirit that was on Abraham who obeyed God and left his homeland even though he didn't know where he was going. Uh, he offered up his own son Isaac in faith. It's the same spirit that was on Sarah, his wife, that allowed her to receive by power and conceive in her old age and have a son who was a miracle. Isaac and Joseph, 
Jacob and Joseph, they all exercised faith. Moses, the same spirit was on him. Rahab, who welcomed the spies and did not perish with the disobedient, the same spirit. But, but what I'm trying to get to is that in Hebrews 11, there are various unnamed individuals, unnamed individuals who by the same spirit conquered kingdoms. They, they enforced justice. They obtained promises. They, they stopped the mouths of lions. They quenched the power of fire. They escaped the edge of the sword. They received back their dead by resurrection and endured persecution and suffering for the faith. And I'm so glad that there's some unnamed individuals because that leaves room for you and me. Because the same spirit that was operating 2,000 years ago is the same spirit that's going to show up with you on your workplace. It's going to open your eyes to new insights. It's going to give you ways to prosper here and now. It's the same spirit that's going to show up in your house and allow you to keep on loving and keep on working and keep on serving and keep on doing what it is that God has called you to do. It's the same spirit that's going to show up in the sanctuary and prick you even at this moment to open your eyes to the power of God, to let you feel God's presence moving through your bosom. Well, my brothers and sisters, I'm finished now, but I wish somebody would realize that your name might not be in the book but you've got a testimony. When you look back over your life, you know that the Spirit of God has been operating in your life. It's been healing wounds. It's been giving you peace that passes all understanding. It's been giving you joy that you can't describe, joy that the world didn't give to you, joy that the world can't take away. And so I want to encourage you to, to recognize that the Holy Spirit gives us new possibilities possibilities for peace, possibilities for power, possibilities for new insights, possibilities to be a benefit to other people. And so I hope that you will trust with me this morning that that same spirit is alive and available right now. That same spirit dwells within us by the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ and the ongoing work of the Father, the Son, and their Spirit. Their Spirit is the one that breathes into you, that gives you that strength you didn't know you had, that gives you that ability to keep on going, that, that endurance. That, that endurance is not because of your physical strength. That endurance is the abiding presence of God filling you up and allowing you to do amazing things. And so if you're here today, we, we offer Christ to you. Jesus Christ was the bearer of the Spirit and He is the giver of the Spirit. It's a gift that keeps on giving. The Holy Spirit is the thing that keeps church lively. It keeps church spontaneous. It keeps us with energy that, that we wouldn't have. And so we want you to come and join up with us. You know, I heard something that is remarkable. And as we wrestle with and understand the awful war that is going on in Palestine and the tragedy and so many different perspectives there. Uh, I heard something, there were some doctors who went to Gaza, they were American citizens and they came back and it brings me to tears the things that they saw while they were there. And not only is there the war and, and, and the struggle, but but there is a famine going on at the same time. And, and as I was hearing about this in the news, on National Public Radio, and they began to describe it, one of the doctors said something that I'll never forget. The doctor said that malnourished people's wounds don't heal. People who are malnourished, their body does not have the strength 
to heal their wounds. And I believe there's somebody right now who needs the bread of life. You need the word of God. You need the fellowship of fellow believers because you're malnourished right now. And so the healing capacity that's already in you can't take place because you're malnourished. So we, we want you to come on home. Come home because we're going to make a meal for you. We're going we're gonna to prepare the bread. We're going to show you the love. We're going to surround you and fill you with love and encouragement. So come on home. If, you, if you've been away, come on home. It's not too late. Amen. If we, if we could put the um, barcode up, we've had, I think, over 15 people either return or virtually come down the aisle. New, we've got at least four or five new members uh, since we started this journey in January. So we thank God for those folks. Amen. 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 All right. Amen. Amen. Uh, let's, let's open the altar for prayer. Let's open the altar for prayer. It's not too late. You can put your camera on that uh, barcode. coming from the balcony. Amen. Amen. standing here, God, in need of a blessing. God, you have given us so much. You have given us your mercy. You reconciled us with yourself, God. God, you've allowed us to identify as your children. And so, God, we're coming as your children. We're coming, Daddy, and we're asking you to fill us now with your spirit. Yes, sir. God, we thank you for your Holy Spirit and opening up new possibilities, God. And I'm praying, God, that you will give us opportunities to talk about, talk about you this week, God. God, we spend so much time talking about so many things, God, but I'm praying that your people who are called by your name yes, will get sir. some opportunities to talk about you, yes, to talk about how good you've been, how powerful you've been, God, how, how you have shown yourself mighty in their life, God. I'm praying that. And God, you have set us free, God. You've set us free from fear. You've set us free from alienation from you, God. God, you allow us now to walk with you constantly day in and day out. And so, God, I'm praying that you will Put some extra pep in somebody's step this yes, week, God. God. Yes, God. That you will give somebody some extra energy, God. That as they wait on you, yes, they yes, will God. put on new strength, God. Yes, God. That you'll lift them up on wings of eagles, God. So they'll see their situation from a new heavenly vantage point, God. That you will walk with them and talk with them, God. And make sure that they know that they are your very own. God, I'm praying for those who are recovering from medical calamity, God. I, I pray, God, that you will give them the faith to trust in you, God. I'm praying for those, God, who are entering into or coming out of financial difficulty, God. Allow them to trust that you are a God who can supply all of their needs, God. 
I'm praying for somebody, God, who has been racked with fear, God. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Open their eyes to your presence. Open their ears to your voice, God. And remove the fear from their heart, God, and replace it with faith and trust in you. And God, I'm asking that you do all of this and everything that needs to be done because you are a God who every now and then stands up in the throne room in heaven, yes. praying and interceding for us, God, yes. so that even if we don't know what to pray, God, you and your Holy Spirit are groaning yes, the sir. prayers we can't pray. Yes. Groan on, Father. Pray on, Father. Pray the prayers we don't even know to pray, God so that we can feel the power, so that others might see how good it is to call on your name. In the mighty and matchless name of Jesus the Christ we pray, amen. 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 As you make your way back, we're going to um, give the benediction Amen. 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 Y'all seem like you want to sing. No? All right. That's all right. No, that's all right. That's all right. We came here to praise and to worship. We thank God for the opportunity to celebrate together how good God has been for us. And now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and present you before his throne with exceeding great joy to the only wise God our Savior be power majesty and dominion both now and forevermore and the people of God said amen, amen. Pray.